We're live. And hello, we're streaming live from the Drum Brigade. <laughs> I'm your host, Adam Gust. <laughs> Again, uh, let's see. You just I got I got some caffeine rush on that. I went into <laughs> game show host mode. All right. Sorry, you guys might see me see me jump off a little bit early, but um, all good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hey, here we are. How is everybody this week? Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And so, so yeah, Corey asked me to host and I happily obliged and I was just thinking, okay, what's, uh, I thought of the times I've hosted before and kind of thought of well, what would be a next step to that because some of you have been following me along and figuring out what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I thought of this, like, I really am totally in love with this kind of, I call it the five rudiments of the nervous system, the side of the grace being the acronym grounded, relaxed, aware, centered, and embodied. And I just, I remember I did a, one of them was on these specific exercises as to how I went about them kind of allocating or distributing these five rudiments into drumming. And so I thought I would do it, just go through an actual practice session with it. So, so the first one is grounding, the big G. And so the first thing to do even before we think of playing any rhythms is just having the heels on the ground and imagine these roots coming up from our knees, going down our shins, coming out of the bottoms of our feet and into the earth. I really like this image of just feeling super connected to the earth because our nervous system doesn't want our body to fall over and any kind of imbalance, it, kind of, it gives it a little tinge of stress. So the more kind of centered we are and grounded to the earth we are, it's our nervous system likes that. So the next thing would be, okay, where's the other point at which we are in contact with the earth? It'd be, well, we're all sitting here, so our sitting bones, kind of the same way we're thinking of our heels Think of our sitting bones connecting to the chair and note, just feel that all of our weight is hinging or is resting on those four points, our two sit bones, butt bones, and our heels. And that really kind of gives it this bottom up feeling before we get to rudiments in the hands of just, wow, okay, yeah, my whole being, my whole body is resting on those four spots. And so taking a sec to center with that, be grounded with that, and then an actual drumming implication or exercise manifestation of that I feel is all four limbs together. So if your heels are on the ground, lift your heels up and just drop them together. Make sure that they hit together. Um, if you do are at a drum set, you're a lucky guy. You can put the bass drum and the hi-hat together. Just make sure that those hit precisely together. And same thing with the hands. Just to just not even, you know, not worrying about the rhythm even too much. Just kind of thinking of the heels together, grounded, the sit bones together, grounded, dropping the heels together and grounded, and dropping the sticks on a pad together and grounded. And that's great. I think that's, I, I'm thinking of this as being in tune. Be, it's a kind of a body tune up. You know, if your guitar player gets on stage and plays out of tune, and then remember you ever been on stage and you hear it out of tune and the guy doesn't tune, and you're like, oh no. <laughs> and you're like, oh boy, we're already starting off bad. So this is so putting all four of these together then, let's let's start, let's just keep this sort of this is all four limbs playing together. And as we're doing this, we can still imagine the heels when they hit the ground together. Imagine like you're just kind of pulling the heels up off of the earth and then dropping them again. And they're naturally grounded again to the earth. And same thing with your sit bones. Try to make sure there's no kind of asymmetry, everything's balanced. And the same rooted bottom up sensation in the hands as we're playing all four limbs together. So that's kind of just a general overview of grounding. Wouldn't it be amazing if everything that you played on the drums felt like this? Like just imagine, like you're super grounded, everything is playing together. You don't have to even really think too much about what you're doing. Like this is that point of groundedness where you can feel confident and that you belong in what you're doing because nobody can do this better than you do this at your best. Like, you know, when all four limbs hit together, 
It doesn't get better than that. And so, so anything we do that kind of compounds on this, try to think of returning to this space. So this is a general idea of grounding. So relaxation. This now we're going to get to the relaxation spectrum, which is any kind of tension in the body can be described from zero to ten. So any like if, if a nerve is not being fired by any cognitive impulse whatsoever, it's an absolute rest. It's at zero, and if it's as taut as you can possibly flex it, then it's a ten. And so we're going to take different muscle groups of the body while we're doing this and go from zero up to 10, hold 10 for a while for a few counts, and then go back to zero. So we're going to start with our, what do we start? Our back. Think of our back muscles. They're not, you don't normally think of them as influential in these four limbs, but it is. So start it at zero. See if you can try to get it to zero or whatever you think zero is. And go one two, start tensing up, three, four, five, definitely feeling tension, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Our posture probably changed, it affects our breathing, and you're holding ten, and now we're going to count back, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, still tension, four, three, two, one. That tension in the back affected the breathing, and ideally, that holding it at 10 took a little bit of work and mo made us relax into our back more at zero than when we started. That's the premise of this. Maybe you felt that, maybe you didn't. You, If you do it enough, eventually you will feel how like returning to zero from what you thought zero was actually is a deeper relaxation. So now this is when it gets interesting when we start putting it in the arms because this is going to affect your playing and it's going to make you sound bad, but it's going to help us all understand how our physiology and tension affect our playing. So now think about your shoulder. Let's do both shoulders. So the fingers are still relaxed, forearms, biceps, but here where there's tension, so we're going to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, holding some tension, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now you're holding it. Oh, there I sped up. I <laughs> felt that. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, still tension, 4, 3, 2, 1. And try to sink into that zero, or from 1 to zero especially. Try to kind of relax into it and think, what, am I less tense than I was before? And so this is a great way to take simple beats and simple exercises and work with them and try to find better ways of performing them and trying to, in the grounding sense, get everything to feel like this, whether you're playing Steve Gadd Mozambique beats or break beats, double bass, whatever. What if it all felt like this? So this, this is a way to try to dig deeper into that. So now let's try the forearms. This gets interesting because this is def definitely going to affect how we play. <laughs> so let's give it a whirl. Forearms tense. One, two, three, four, five. Some tension. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, good, 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 good. Now we're going to hold this one for a while. If you're, re if you're really at ten, you should be starting to get a feel a little burn. Feel a little tense, feel like your mind's trying to figure out how do I keep from rushing <laughs> if I'm holding this much tension. All right, now we're coming back. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, still tight. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Man, and I feel, I've definitely felt that one, especially early in the morning, like you get back to zero from that one, and wow, that's, whoo, got some more blood flowing, and I felt like I sunk deeper into the relaxation in the arms. Okay, same thing. Now the legs, we're going to do the thighs first. So think of thighs flexing. One, two, three, four, five. Still try to be, keep them moving. This has got some tension in the legs. You can see a little bit of definition change maybe, and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now you're still moving the ankles and holding ten. Hold that for a while so that it gets tired. So when you get back to zero, it's really abs. Try to get that zero as absolute zero as possible. All right, coming back. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Hold that midway tension a little bit. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. And I feel a deeper breath when I do that. When I relax the legs like that, and then suddenly the heels feel a little softer to me. 
All right, now we're going to try the shins. And this is going to make it hard to <laughs> hit the heels on the floor, but let's try it. Flexing the shins. One, two, three, four, five. A little bit of tension. Trying not to flex the thighs, which is a trick. That's coordination. <laughs> and then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Almost feels like it wants to cramp. Hold it for a sec. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, so that's kind of, we got a little bit head to toe with that. That's a good warm up. I thought it'd be nice to start chops and coffee this way. Because I feel like it gets the blood, it's constriction and expansion. It's very much a somatic experiencing technique kind of understanding ways of measuring tension. Any way you can measure anything in the body is really great for figuring out a, kind of just more awareness of sensation and being able to describe it in numeric terms or in adjectives. And this is a good exercise for that because you start to even notice throughout the day, you're like, wow, my shoulder's kind of at a three right now. What the hell's up with that? Why is that? What can I do to get rid of that? What can reduce that? Especially in drumming, that has huge, com you know, implications and as well as the rest of your life so that's we're at r all right we're cruising right into a oh shit i forgot to set up my app <laughs> there's a uh, heart rate variability app i meant to just set up and i didn't shit well another good thing we can do is just long breathing imagine that you have a tube in your mouth just like a straw in your mouth and you're going to inhale for 10 counts it's through this tube just the idea just to, so that we don't go or, you know, take a deep, that's because something that happens when we take a deep breath, the tendency is to inhale quickly. And that has very much a sympathetic nervous system response, fight or flight, because if you're scared, you know, you kind of huff in. And so anytime we breathe in quickly, our nervous system gets this message like something exciting is happening. Whoa, wait, you know, we're on the orange alert, you know, like the tension level raises. So just if we're, especially when things get tough on the drums, being able to take long, deep inhalations and long, deep exhalations is great. So I'm going to do 10 counts. Imagine you have the straw in your mouth. Here we go. In inhale. Oh, I'll count us in. Sorry, I can't talk and inhale. I just realized. <laughs> so I'll count us in four beats, and then we're going to 10 inhale, 10 exhale. One, two, three. Exhale. Good. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a general idea. And we should be able to see if we can keep time and still feel the rhythm of our heartbeat. This is a really good polymetric exercise. And so see if we can hold whatever rhythm you had before and still feel the heartbeat and not have it affect your drumming rhythm. This is a concept in somatic experience they call it 50-50, like being 50% aware of your outside world while you're 50% aware of your inside world, like really committing attention to how your body is feeling and messaging is coming to your brain and balancing that with like doing this outside manifestation of drumming, embodying the rhythm ultimately. And so if you can be 50% aware of both, that's really when you can get into flow. Because when you get too focused on just what's happening on the outside, you're more likely to trip up. Or like imposter syndrome we talked about, you're more likely to think, oh, external world is impacting how I'm feeling about what I'm doing. If you can really be aware of the sensation and make sure that you can make that sensation feel as positive as possible, then you're, you're in really good shape for trying to get into a flow state. So awareness, it's a proprioception. If you ever want to Google that term, that's all we do as drummers. It's the body in relation to another object and how we act in accordance to where it is. Like right now, the proprioceptive measures I'm implementing are the sticks in my hands. How are the sticks relating to my hands and how is the how are the sticks relating to the rebound of the pad? That's all our awareness of proprioception and this is again has a lot to do with sensation and interoception your perception of internal messaging from the body so that's awareness <laughs> now we're getting to centered 
centered is uh, bilateral symmetry. Anything that happens on one side automatically affects the other. It's just part of biology, and it's really good at kind of zeroing in on where our attention lies, because sometimes the tension is happening in relation to something else on the other side of the body. And so a really good way to understand this is to check, well, we're like, we'll take what we're doing and take it up off the pad and see, is it, are we the same? Is that the same stick height? So if you can check out yourself, implement a little vanity and look at yourself in the zoom and see, if, am I really keeping even on either side? Whoops, I, I actually wasn't. The camera can lie a little bit. Try and then try to go back down to the pad and try to, we did this exercise before, how you are in the air and then try to slowly drop the hands and try to play pianissimo with full stick heights and see which hand tends to do better. Like that's, that's if whichever hand kind of, there's one that's gonna wanna stutter because I think where are we train our hands to think in terms of playing quiet by tensing up. Because when we're close to the drum, sometimes we can play precise if we tense up. But man, imagine if you can do a full stick height completely relaxed and play pianissimo, the impact that would have on your playing. I mean, it just automatically would add a lot of finesse, a lot of opportunity for you to play quiet and play things that you haven't played before because we're so dependent on how we move around the drums and how that dictates our dynamics. And so this had really, for me, I noticed it in the left, like the left one, I try to, it just barely, the right always tends to hit first. You know, when I try to do that, it's hard. I mean, it's funny. I talk about how important this is and I still suck at it. I think I'll probably die sucking at this exercise because it's so hard, but it's such a finger control thing and such a finesse stroke, like four strokes up, four strokes pianissimo. Ah, it's okay. Four strokes up. One, two, three, four, four down. Four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Try to feel like which hand is which. Because sometimes if we put, we go back to this, it's such an ingrained groove thing that we don't really notice the how centered it is or how the balance is happening between the hands. But when you start changing things slightly and really monitoring how those changes affect your timing and your feel, you really you start to feel how where how centered you are when you play and all right we can take a break from pounding out eighth notes and now we arrive at embodied this is the fifth rudiment it's uh and it's so to me this is very important because so far we're through four rudiments already and we haven't talked about snare drum rudiments at all and so the what happens in embodiment is that brings you into the present because you cannot embody anything in the future that's not what it is you know it's and you can't embody anything in the past because it's already happened the only way that we achieve any kind of embodiment hey jason oh jason's got a roll uh well i got yeah so uh, before i talk about embodiment are there any questions about any of this or did anyone notice anything about their technique or or i can keep going makes sense to me yeah, I, do. I noticed a lot. Um, the, t the intensity thing, building the tension on my back specifically, man, it just like I started immediately like rushing or like and um, feeling stress, stressed out instead of feeling centered and like loose on the drums. It was like or on my pad. I felt like, oh, like I was having a panic attack or something. So that was really interesting. Yeah, the back's a heavy one because you do, we, or at least I didn't think about it for a long time. I thought about my shoulders, my arms, and my legs. But the back affects breathing and, and it affects your just overall sense of stress response. Like, and there could be this tension going on there and you don't even know it and you're so focused on relaxation everywhere else, but you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot if you don't, if we're not aware of that. And that's something I've been working a lot on in the therapy I've been doing with my coach. She keeps like, she can tell whether my shoulders are here or here, whether there's tension in my back and I feel it now like here. Okay. There's no tension here. I feel it like there's a little flex. And once there's that little flex, and you get into a stressful situation, you don't have reins on that. Like once you get stressed out and you're at zero, 
it's it's easier to maintain zero than one. Like I think that like things that happen in the outside world can really latch on and kind of hook into those minor tensions we hold and pull on them. And I think that's what happens a lot in when people stage fright, essentially, like the whatever tension we already hold. And that's such a metaphor for what's happening in our brains. Like if we feel there's a little chink in the armor and how we present ourselves or how we feel about our voice or anything, and we're put into a stressful situation, suddenly those you know, insecurities can really take hold and suddenly you kind of get put on your heels a lot. And so it's, it's kind of a bigger metaphor for you know, therapy type stuff. But uh, so we're, so those are the four exercises or rudiments of getting the nervous system to essentially just feel safe. It's a neuroception is another kind of psychobabble word that I love that just all it and all it means is it does the nervous system recognize threat or relationality? Is it relating to ourselves and to like kind of contemplating our own individuality or is it reacting to threat? And so and what degree of each is it cape, you know, the pie chart? Is it 50-50? Is it zero one hundred? And so this is that's, that's what all what polyvagal theory is about is measuring our stress response and there are just some unbelievable ways that these practitioners are able to do it through facial cues and body cues and i can't believe the shit my therapist knows about me <laughs> just by like what seeing me get out of my car you know and i mean what if we all had that sort of attunement to each other and therefore to ourselves it'd be amazing and so this is just an important concept of embodiment is just automatically grounds us in the present because that's what it is. We're embodying what we're doing. We are putting our whole heart and soul, our 50-50 awareness of the inside world and the outside world into what we're doing. And there's no room for worried about our reputation a year from now or what somebody said to us a week ago. There's just no room because we're in the present. And so the more we can focus on grounding, relaxation, awareness, and centering when we go to actually playing the drums, then the embodiment happens. So. We, so there, ideally, we carve out this place in our nervous system so that these five rudiments have us able to play this and it's, we can hold a good tempo and we feel safe and feels right and relaxed. Great. Okay, well, this isn't going to get you a gig. You, know? <laughs> you have to be able to go beyond pounding out eighth notes in all four limbs. So what do we do? We start adding some stress. We start adding some challenges in order to, which isn't going to raise our stress level. But if we're constantly aware of how being grounded, relaxed, aware, centered, and embodied, then we can increase our stress resilience in order to deal with this. So kind of pendulating another SE term, pendulation, going from a point where we know we're grounded to a point where we know we're not and being able to kind of shift back and forth those and let each other and let those two states inform each other and kind of flavor each other to the point where we can eventually kind of calm and regulate the stress state because we're always able to kind of know what it feels like to not be stressed and kind of pendulate back and forth. So this first one's easy. It's actually reduction. And it sounds so super easy until we get to the left foot. <laughs> so the, we're playing eighth notes and we're going to play quarters Let's put, so we're going to put a quarter note in the right hand and everything else is still playing eighths. One, two, three, four, one. No problem, right? Yeah, cool. And then we're going to go back to ground, our grounded plays. One, so back to eighth notes. So we're just going to do eight counts of each, go back and forth from eighth notes on all four limbs to a quarter note in the right. Quarter on the right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, eight counts of each, sorry, seven, eight, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four. now left hand, left hand quarters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, one. Cool. It's pretty simple. Now we're gonna do right foot quarters. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, one. Right foot quarters. Three, four, one. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now this is it's, it's this is a strange one coming up. I still struggle with this. Play quarters in the left foot. It seems like okay. I'm gonna just behold the eighth notes. Keep them going. 
Keep that same comfort level. Now put a quarter note in the left foot. One, two, one, two, three, four, one. Back. Try to get. We're gonna count you in quarter in the left. One, two, three, four, one, three, four, one, three, one, three, one, three, four, one. So yeah, let's all hold there. So however you happen to do at that, maybe it was easy, maybe it was hard. Oh, well, I mean, you just think about, okay, I had this comfortable thing, I was grooving along with eighth notes and all four limbs, and now I took away an, an a upbeat eighth note. And it, for me, that left foot, there's some tension happens there. And I think it's because we're so embodied, or rather disembodied, to just say fuck off to the left foot so much. I mean, we only kind of worry about it when we open and close the hi-hat. But if we really sign off on this idea of the feet being grounded, and that's grounding our nervous system, and that's allowing us to reach this deeper state, 50-50, and then we can get into this flow state, we, re I, we really need to pay attention to what's happening in the left foot. And I've noticed in myself, even years of working on this, especially when I put the foot cam up and I try to put on four cameras and turn on lights and fit logic and I'm, I get in this stress state and like all of a sudden years of working on this and my left foot starts a little, and I know that's like because it's a manifestation of me being stressed inside. And so then now if I take that and I take that to a big stage or an audition, whatever tension is in that left foot, according, if we do sign off on bilateral symmetry, we know that that left foot tension is affecting equal and oppositely the other foot. And we know that that's disrupting our grounded sense of our nervous system. And we know that that's affecting our centeredness. And we know that that tension is affecting our awareness. And so uh, these little tiny tensions have such an impact. And Joe, especially, and we can really kind of tease them out. You know, if we do these really simple exercises where all you do is like kind of casket with playing a quarter note in the left foot so th and this is so this is actually a reduction exercise the other way if you and so a step back from that if you did have trouble with that one we can do the same thing and just stop playing the left foot see how that goes so all limbs together one two three four rest the left foot and absolutely no tension no cheating no tension in the left foot. Even though we're keeping this up, now we're going to activate the left foot again. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And now rest the left foot. One, two, three, four. Rest. Two, three, four, seven, two. Three. Back. So let's try the. So that's the idea with this. So I, this works. I've kind of thrown it around the horn. I somehow think of basketball practice where you kind of shoot from four different spots, you know, side basket, the elbow of the key, and then these four spots. And I kind of think of like kind of shooting around and moving different rhythms around this way. So this next one is going to be move. Not it's not reduction and it's not augmentation. It's actually just moving a note to an upbeat. So we're going to add a double in the right hand and move it to alternating like this. Double. Double. So that's the exercise. I'll count it in. You do a double on the right foot and it moves it to alternating sticking. Or I'm sorry, in the right hand. Right hand double. One, two, three, four, double. And I'll count us back in to do the double back to unison. One, two, three, four, double. Yeah, good. So that's the right hand, left hand. One, two, three, four, double. One, two, three, four, double. And try to get really hone in on being grounded and centered and grooved into how the body feels really capable and relaxed and solid in this eighth note state. And then when you try to monitor your tension and you know check in with your relaxation and make sure that nothing is changing when you go to the upbeats in the left hand. So we'll do the double on the right foot now. One, two, three, four, double. Like a punk rock beat. Ah, ta -do, ba -do, ba -do, ba -do, only without flaming. And then a double on the right foot. One, two, three, four, double. 
And then now we go to the left foot again. That's I have a section I'm working on that's called My Left Foot is Kicking My Ass is the name of the chapter. And all it is is honing in on the left foot. Like, I mean, because we've just been marginalizing it our whole drumming lives. We're just like, okay, maybe I'll use you if I need to open the hi-hats. Or I guess if I, you know, I'll let you play two and four. But, you know, and it's like that sort of live gimping it along you know our whole drumming careers has an impact on the right foot it's like that it's just that bilateral symmetry idea so let's try the double on the left foot to bring us into alternating and the double bass guys should have a good <laughs> they're probably better at it than me but good double on the left foot to go to alternating in the feet one two three four double and just try to Make sure that you're still keeping relaxed, even though we shifted out of our happy place of being grounded with all four limbs playing eighth notes. Try to still have that feeling of being grounded, relaxed, aware, centered, and embodied in the same groove, whether you're doing this or back to alternating. So we're going back, we're back to, moving back to unisons. One, two, three, four, double. Now we're all four again. Cool. All right. So now we've been doing this for 30 minutes and I feel a little bit of sweat. It's so funny that like all we're doing is pounding out eighth notes, but I, I feel like some more blood flow and I feel in tune. I feel like if I need to play a unison right now, a goddamn unison's gonna come out, you know, cause I'm just so honed in and grooved in on what unisons feel like. And it, it becomes this awareness that when we don't play unison and we intend to, we feel it. We notice that it doesn't feel the way it does that when we do all four limbs together. And so, yeah, it's sort of, I think it's like, well, I don't know, Steve Gadd always comes to mind when I think of unisons, just the way he orchestrates them and how clean they are and how good they sound and intentional and balanced and all that. And so I always think like, yeah, if I want to have that, if I want to have my hi-hat like I really want that cutoff to be super precise. I need to make sure that my left foot is being able to like be, be grounded in these unisons. So the next now we're moving along. Okay, we're gonna move up the ladder a little bit. We're gonna move to three over two. And so this rhythm, it's a not difficult three over two rhythm. We're gonna move, we're gonna send it around the key, push it around the horn. So we're gonna do three over two, the three in the right hand and the two and all the other lips. So we've done that before. And then back to unison. So here we go. Going to three over two in the right. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. And mind our feet. Make sure that no tension in the feet has changed, no tension in the shoulder and the back has changed from being all four unisons. And then we're gonna go back to eighth note unison. One, two, three, four, one. Cool. Now three in the left. One, two, three, four, one. Not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult. One, two, three, four, one. Back to unison. Three in the right. Right foot. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, 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 two, three, four. And back to unisons. One, two, three, four, one. All right, my left foot's kicking my ass. Can we make the three happen in the left foot and keep unisons in the other three limbs? One, two, three, four. Not difficult in the feet. Not difficult. And back to unisons. One, back to unison. Cool. And now what's funny, I noticed that's easier then moving the left foot to quarter notes. I don't know why that is. It's the way it is for me, and I've noticed in a lot of people that it's easier to do a three in the left foot than it is to go from eighth notes to quarter notes, which is just, I don't know, I think that says something about how we learn how to play. Because I feel like if we're playing quarter notes or eighth notes in the left foot, that should be helping us to be grounded in the rhythm, ideally, right? And that should be kind of carving a template with to make sure that all the other limbs are playing in unison. But I don't think that's how we learn, or at least I didn't, and then we have to end up having to relearn how to kind of let the left foot be a guide for us and help to ground us in the rhythm. And so now we're going to do the upbeat three over two. So if, if the downbeat's here, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, the three will start on beat two. 
One, two, three, four, one, two. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not one, two, three, four, one. Back to unison. So that's the invert that's the inverted three over two, just starting it on two. Same thing in the left hand. One, two, three, four, one. Not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not one. Three, four, one, two, three, not difficult, not difficult, not one, two, three, four, one, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not one, two, three, four, and back to unison, two, three, four, one, right foot, one, two, three, four, one, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not difficult, not to one, two, three, back to unison, one, and the left foot. One, two, three, four, one, cha 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 dun 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 What song is that? Oh shit. Everybody wants to rule the world, yeah, it's the left foot playing the guitar part. And back to unison, two, three, four, one. So yeah, let yourself take a breath now and kind of know these spun these rhythms around the horn. And this is in general this Works out. This is just to use one limb using one rhythm at a time, but then you start using two limbs to do these rhythms at a time. And so it'd be three over two with the right side, three over two with the left. And I've noticed when I've, it makes everything I play just sound better when I do that. And I feel like it can be more intentional because I'm just more aware of how my body is reacting to these shifts in rhythm. And so then leather that's okay this is going to be a cranking up the uh, intensity barometer or level to four over three and so that rhythm and so this is three over two in the right and this is four and we're back to unison and i love these i love how these two rhythms work together because they sound similar but they're just a little bit different so three over two in the right. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Back to unison. Now four. And you kind of go into three, four here. Really, that's how I'm thinking of it. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And back, two, three, unison. Now left hand, four over three. One, I'm gonna count it in in three since this is, feels it's in, like it's in three. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, and back to unison, and one. We're back to unison. Now that same rhythm in the right. One, two, three. I don't know if you can hear my feet or not. One, back to unison, and we're back to unisons. Now left foot, one, two, three. One, two, three, unison. Cool, that's it. And now, so that's just taking this one rhythm and moving it around the horn and the body. And now if, when you start moving those rhythms around you i mean if between themselves so we had the adding a double to turn it into alternating from unison we had three over two to do a little polyrhythmic exercise we had four over three and then we also had moving to quarter notes and then we even had just laying out completely like resting and letting the other three limbs kind of hold down the rhythm for us and so if we relate this all back to the beginning where we're trying to stay grounded relaxed aware centered and embodied if we can keep that foundation if we always have that sense like okay at any point i can stop what i'm doing and i can return to a place that i know i'm grounded and i'm safe and i belong <laughs> and people like me i don't know you just go back to this sense in the nervous system like you're safe and you're doing okay and it's like when things go wrong, I can think, oh, you know what? I can go back to this kind of, I call it the jackhammer, you know, just like pounding out eighth notes in the right. Like if I'm on a gig and I can't play 
eighth notes hands together and keep time like I shouldn't have that gig like that's such a basic thing but it's like just knowing that we can go back to that at any point to just sort of like shed our doubts or kind of give us a little breath and just go to home for a minute that can really help and so, I'd, so doing these hands together exercises something I've been working on hi-hat like if we're keeping hands to all limbs together, move it to hi-hat, and then being able to move either hand to the snare. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And try to keep those unisons really tight. Because if, if you're not able to play a unison this way, you know that there's something wrong with how you're moving. You're either rushing or dragging, and it's involuntary. Like, to, again, it's totally important. Whoops. It's totally important to be able to have a human feel and rush and drag, but it should be intentional when we do it, or at least in my opinion, I think that. And so if you're playing these hands together, which should be our point of being completely grounded and relaxed, aware, centered, embodied, and we lose that when we go from hi-hat to snare, there's kind of something wrong with our fundamental ability to move between those two instruments on the drums. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a, and then, so once you get to the eighth notes on the hi-hat in both hands, and you can start adding these other variations to it, adding the three over two, the broken, or the inverted three over two, four over three gets really cool. Like if you hold down, if let's just, if you do, we will rock you, and you hold down left, hand eighth notes boom boom got boom boom got boom boom got it's really simple i mean all it's four over three and then you can kind of move the sound source around move it from bell to toms come back to hi-hat it adds a lot, so much variation inside of this very grounded rhythm. And so, and, you, and then one of my favorite things is shifting between the three over two and the four over three inside of this. So, So that, that there's an exercise, if you want to try to mix this up a little bit, it would be the four over three for three beats, and then the three over two for two beats. So I'll do it in eighth notes first. So. so it's in five, four essentially, but when you superimpose it over four, it sounds, starts sounding cool. So one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Does that, does that rhythm make sense? It's a cool rhythm. It's kind of a launch or jumping off point for a lot of different possibilities. Hey, Sam. Do you ever switch the lead uh, between when you go from, uh, as opposed to which one does the two and which one does the the four? Oh, when you're, yeah. When you're going back and forth? Yeah, bop, absolutely. Bop, bop, bop. Yeah, just for the sake of, sake of exp or giving an example, I did, oh, my light's dying. Oh, shit. But, uh... Yeah, if that's the whole point, like when we went through before, like moving the rhythm between all the hands, but all right. the limbs even. Yeah, doing the same thing here, keeping that grounded thing on a hi-hat or right hand on rim or left hand on snare, unaccented to accent or ride cymbal, however you're holding down these unisons, that being able to shift the, yeah, then the right hand, so... And back to triplets. And we will rock you in the kick as I think I just, that's the one I kind of default to. So, and then you can even shift from the downbeat three over two to the upbeat three over two. That's a cool shift.
And that could be grace notes on the snare, hi-hat, anything. I mean, that's, that's what's so cool about it. As long as you're always holding down this grooved, ingrained, regulated equilibrium of, you know, unisons, knowing what that feels like, knowing that it's inside of you from the ground up, then when you make these shifts, it doesn't, you know, stagger. It doesn't kind of throw you off or anything. So yeah, 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 definitely being able to do it in both hands, I think just opens up a world of possibility. And then once you end up automatically end up running into rudiments, like the more you explore this, the more you just, okay, oh, wow, suddenly I'm playing a paradiddle or, you know, I mean, you're just kind of shifting doubles and singles in each hand. And so I think that's a better way of finding out about snare drum rudiments is by kind of figuring this out first, like should, should rudiments be the first thing we learn as drummers? No. Should it be the sixth thing? Maybe, you know, maybe the first five should be, you know, grace, I think. And so I that's just the platform I'm going to be moving ahead with. And it seems like some people are resonating with, I, oh my gosh. So uh, <laughs> I think I told you a few months ago about this podcast I did with Francesca Maxime and I thought I totally botched it and I thought she wasn't even going to air it and she aired it <laughs> and uh, it was, I'm really proud of it. It was fucked up. I had such a horrible physical memory, emotional memory of it because it was emotional and I thought it was a mess. And when I went back and I really listened to how, how she was kind of dimensioning what I was talking about, I was like, wow, that I wasn't even listening to her. <laughs> I mean, not well enough to really get what she was saying, you know, and but, and so then she posted it and there have been a bunch of somatic practitioners that have been kind of sending me messaging and wanting to know what I'm doing. And so I'm, I want to start a, a Facebook group that's half somatic practitioners and drummers and be able to have a dialogue about like what, because there are some, there are practitioners who want to study drums. There was one, Maddie, she was it's this lesbian lady in Massachusetts. She's like, I want to take drum lessons. I want to know more about somatic therapy through the eyes of a drummer. And so I feel like this crossover between these two communities could be cool. So I, yeah, so I'll, I'll be hitting you guys up for being a part of it once I figure out how I'm going to kind of build that. And I don't even know how to build a community, but at this point, I, I just want to see what happens in the threads. You know, I think it'd be fucking interesting. So. I think that's cool, man. And, and congrats on, the, on that podcast, too, because it's, yeah, I think it, it's, what this is, it's probably what people are chiming in on is probably the same thing that I've been, you know, that that got my attention is you know the the emotional connect and and then the the struggles that you've had but then how that's brought you to here and and how you used both of these elements you know like like running and then all of your studies and all of that stuff like it is really interesting and um useful information for a lot of different people not just drummers you know so. thanks yeah i've been really surprised that man i was i couldn't even watch it for a week she sent me the email and said that it posted i'm like what <laughs> like fuck i remembered all these things that i said and some few things i regret but when i look back in the context of it, it's like no it made sense it was genuine it was raw but yeah. it was the truth and it's like if i'm gonna move forward with what i think is the truth then i gotta fucking say this and yeah, yeah so i'm, I'm or like your truth, you know, that's like, man, that's huge. <laughs> Thanks, man. Cool. So, I mean, okay, I've, we've been through this with me. This is sort of the more, you know, honed in on drumming exercise version of this much bigger thing. I mean, it's so much bigger than drumming to me, this the whole somatic experiencing thing and just definitely any kind of stress resilient applied embodiment. And I still don't see people doing it. I mean, I got the, yeah, like, uh, who's, oh, who's that classical percussionist, Jeffrey, that you mentioned a few times? Josh Jones. Jo Josh Jones. Yeah, yeah, that guy. He's, I, I would like to have a conversation with him. Oh, you uh, should. Yeah. I'd definitely be into it, man. Yeah. And Dave Elich, I mean, he's a little unapproachable. He's kind of aloof, but I really like that he's trying to, trying to apply embodiment to the drums and doing so like a motherfucker in his playing definitely yeah he's probably just funny that is um is i know i mean i'm who am i to critique him but i think i see a lot of 
ten, like he looks tense when he plays. He does not, and, he, and like that, his whole thing is like about not being tense, and you know. But it's like he seems like he's way hitting way too hard, and like just playing way too intense. But who knows? Maybe he knows something I don't. Yeah, that's the craziest thing. Like uh, I guess from the outside, same thing with like Ari Honig. You would think that they look super tense up for that, but like I've heard, I've heard him talk, and also like he works with somebody for looseness and everything like that so i guess inside they feel loose they feel like nothing's happening you know everybody everybody's body is different so they know their own like their own threshold so for like ari and him they they probably look tense but they're probably like super relaxed yeah, yeah he's bulky he's definitely very strong yeah yeah, yeah he's uh, he looks he looks like he's um like i can't figure out my brain starts messing with me where i'm like i don't know how he's pulling off what he's doing because he looks like he's he's too like cavemanish, you know. Like if that, that sounds that sounds really mean, but it's my, it's, my the beard and the, it's probably the beard and the ponytail that he has. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. he looks right. He looks rugged. Yeah. I yeah. also feel like. Uh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. No, go. No, Sam, go. No, I was gonna say I also feel like traditionally when drummers think about looseness they think about it in their wrists and in their arms and there are aspects you know like I, I never really thought about the tightness of my legs or the tightness of like my lower back and there are so many things that traditional drummers are like okay when you you know your wrist especially that was the first thing i learned you know you have to have a real loose wrist and that's kind of where i feel like a lot of the focus is but there are so many more aspects you know learning through this this experience so many more body aspects that it directly in fact or uh, affect how you play and how you feel and there are you know dudes who have real real light wrists can still benefit from loosening their back or loosening their shoulders or being aware of their legs or you know the whole aspect of the body yeah yeah completely it's so heavy and it's so simple it's so logical but i feel like we try to impose this rational cognitive i think therefore i am philosophy on it rather than i feel therefore i am like if our body is talking to us that's existential to me that's like the heart of drumming and art and i think that's really ignored by a lot of drummers yeah I'm piggybacking off what sam said i was gonna say this earlier but like it, it makes a lot of sense also have you have you thought about maybe talking to uh either a tap dancer or uh uh, just a dance in general because you're we're talking about our backs or move everything movement balance and i'm thinking like a tap dancer they they're doing rhythm and stuff also and they have to be balanced pretty much all the time and i see i could see them do actually working like one leg does something but the other leg is doing something else to keep them balanced or that's so it's, that's a pretty cool thing to i would think about also just asking like uh tap dancers or regular dancers i know a few tap dancers in town too in la like really, really great tap. One's like, a, uh, she's a, a, like one of the most well-known tap dancers and, and she's doing kind of a similar thing with teaching and groups. And, uh, with Sarah, she's really good. She's been on the podcast too. Oh, oh yeah, what's her name? Uh, it's Sarah, I don't, here I'll find, I'll find her on Instagram. Cause that'd be cool because I think they, they also have to focus on, not focus, but like I think they're, they're very aware of their heart rate they're because they, you know they're tensioning of everything maybe they're loose on their feet like like sam said maybe their their feet are loose but their arms are super tense because they're doing they they don't understand or they not realizing they're doing something up here so that's pretty cool or your neck like after imagine after tapping you're like oh my neck hurts why yeah that's where alexander technique came from as an actor who was noticing that he could rehearse for five hours and be fine but when he was on stage he was blowing his voice out and he couldn't figure out why is that, you know? And it was because there were these tensions that were happening on stage that weren't happening in rehearsal. And they had everything to do with these tiny tensions in his neck. And and like and that was the difference between him being able to have a career or not. And so, yeah, he dived deep into that and it ended up being very stress resilience oriented practice, the embodiment of Alexander, which is what Dave Elidge does. And so, yeah, my biggest influence has been Betsy Politan, is a, who is a mix of Al Alexander and somatic experiencing. And they just go together so seamlessly. Like, I mean, Alexander has already developed so many performance-oriented 
ways of manifesting stress resilience in the body. And it just ties in so well with somatic work. So yeah. Sarah's name is Sour Sour Taps on Instagram. Sour Taps? She also she plays drums a little bit too. She's a, she's a strong, like strong, very strong woman, you know, like very like outspoken and um, she's the boss, you know, like, in, in, <laughs> and um, she's re- made, made a name for herself in tap. She's oh, like, cool. really great, man. And then the other one I, I know is um, Channing Holmes. He's, um, he's a, he's a fantastic, phenomenal drummer and uh, he's a good friend of mine and um, also he does, he's like a designer and he does a lot, a lot of different things, but um, Channing Cook Holmes is his name. But he's a, he's like a, a equally as like he's a, a, a professional touring, working drummer, you know, and, um, and then, but then he's like similar in the tap dance field too. So. Wow, cool. Yeah, there's already an established kind of applied embodiment dance therapy that's it's taken hold extremely well i've seen even like people applying polyvagal technique to dance and i keep waiting for like okay we got the dancers like where are the drummers i still don't see it i mean man so i guess hard man there it's a weird industry i you know that of, of like some Oh, it's, it's an industry built on a lot of followers, but I'm not going to get on that, but it's like, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, um, start making your own path. It, it takes a minute for people to kind of be like, okay, this is cool. I'm willing to try instead of like, no, you have to use the molar technique and you have to practice rudiments and you have to use these products. You know, it's all a big fur. <laughs> yeah, I can't play relaxed with Vader. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that we have too many extremes in the drumming world or musician world where uh, it's either all technique, you know, you get like uh, Virgil Narati, these cats who like excel in the technique stuff and they're great also, but that's what only people hear or see about them is the technique stuff. And then you got the guys that are, man, I just, I just pick up a drumstick and I hit, man. I don't think about anything. Like I don't even tune my drums. Like so, you got these two camps, and no, nobody really wants to get in the middle and be like, "Oh, we can, you know, you know, technique and and studying these things will actually help, and also just having it will help you get more natural and not have to think about it. It's it's harder for, to get drummers like that. At least, yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah. I'm trying to bridge. I guess yeah, the, trying to bridge the gap between those two worlds essentially. Like do, like kind of this exercise I've been talking about is. Like down to goo goo gaga, fucking unison, four limbs, and then eventually getting to the point where into complex polyrhythms, but not in a sense of just to kung fu the mind, but to actually like come up with creative things. Like I mean, to hold down, it's very much based in regulating the rhythm, you know, the nervous, the rhythm section, the nervous system, like holding down something solid and being able to let one limb kind of go off. It's very similar to this pendulation idea, staying grounded in something that we know we're not in a sympathetic nervous system response. We know we're not in fight or flight. We're not going into shutdown. Even though we're experiencing stress, we're still within our range of resilience. And we have ways to kind of, when we feel ourselves, whoops, somebody's tea is happening. Oh, oh. Did, did you hear that? I heard a little bit. No, oh, whatever. What, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so these therapy idea I just they relate to drumming techniques so well and the more I've been practicing them the more I end up playing things I haven't played before and feeling good about it and so, yes, yeah before I jump off this is my wife she was just saying hi this is summer uh, hey summer hey how's it going good how are you guys hey I'm glad Corey could stay at home this morning sounds like he needed it you guys can hang out a little easier <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> well at least be in the same room yeah. yeah, for a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to jump off, but you guys can, are welcome to hang out. Adam's the host, so um, he can, he can, yeah, you guys can. I'm going to stop the, um, oh, no, I can't. Um, when you end the meeting, Adam, it'll just, um, the stream, I think, will will end. So Okay. Right, guys, cool. have a great weekend. Yeah, great. Thanks, Corey. 
Yeah, I, I guess I did want to ask about the pace. Like, I mean, I did what I, an hour went by, and I did this. Did it feel? Or did it feel like it was dragging on? Or I don't, what's your impression of this overall? I felt like everything developed very well. I felt like it, it started in a place where you you established a, a kind of physical position for it, and then everything that we did from there moved from that that core position so i think the the whole thing kind of built very well upon itself oh, okay. and by the end you know I, I was feeling very comfortable you know with these with with the that that kind of home base feeling mm -hmm. and everything that i was doing i really did feel the sensation of when i went back to that home base. i was like okay safe i'm here this is you know it, i i think it is definitely uh paced well i think it, it all leads into itself and it all leads into each other oh cool thanks yeah that's yeah. cool yeah, yeah like you said it's going back to like a home base i would assume it's like uh like the root note if you're doing scales or something like that you always know how to, you mm -hmm. know you're supposed to go crazy and then at least you know what land back on this and you finish your sentence or you finish your thought your idea so you do your phrasing even on drums and then come back to that one thing and you you have a reference points to, to jump off of again you always come back exactly yeah yeah, I got yeah, yeah. what's that i was just gonna say uh for the other thing we were talking about like how to get bridge the gap and stuff for that i think even it, it could be also the word technique is a little weird and um and too uh could be abstract or maybe too focused like all oh, technique is just what i do and what i don't do i like what uh what the late ralph peterson would say he would call it mechanics between um like i'm just working on my mechanics in my arm but the, you know the motion like like what what my body needs to do to get this certain sound or this certain stuff instead of using the word technique it, it, like that helped me more yeah yeah i love bruce becker he uses the term choreography just to go oh, back to the dance yeah. yeah he talks about the choreography of the body you know how are we wanting to rhythmically manifest physically what we're doing and exactly, yeah. yeah the mechanics choreography yeah technique automatically goes to a very niche place for a lot of people very clinical very niche very brainy yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 it separates you from the drum i feel like it separates the human from the drum when you say technique you say okay well there's the person and then you apply the technique and then you have the drums as opposed to the person is moving their body and the drums happen to be in the position that allows those sounds to be, you know, to be correct. And so it, it really leads more towards, you know, how am I, you know, essentially dancing in such a way that allows that particular rhythm, rhythm or, or, you know, sound scale, you know, that, that orchestration or, or whatever it is, it's all tied to your own physical body and nothing else. There's nothing thing else that is that sound the fact that you are moving at a certain speed with a certain intensity and keeping track of that that metric is way more important than uh, than you know oh well wh wh which stick am i using or, or how is my you know is, is my wrist doing this it's am i moving in the correct way that will give me the result that i want yeah that's cool and you never want to hear the uh i don't know about you guys but like if you, i i don't really want to hear a, a a compliment someone goes hey man you you had great technique today right that's <laughs> not the topic you really want man you want like oh man great feel you sounded great all this stuff but like so yeah when, exactly yes they have good technique is like yeah exactly yeah something that's it's like saying someone has nice writing you know what i mean it's like it's like a nice handwriting it's like okay thanks you know <laughs> That's a yeah, backhanded compliment a little bit. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I've been really trying to dissect it because all somatic experiencing is all about bottom up. Like there's the first, if, you know, if it's, it's going to teach anyone anything, it's to focus inside first and see how your outside world changes depending on how you're feeling. And just even just no, just simple things like knowing that the heart has four times a second communication with the brain, whether it's in the danger or not. And so tiny little minute microscopic temporal fluctuations in the heart impact how we feel about what's in front of us. And man, that has huge impact. And then of course the vagus nerve, like nine times more information coming from the internal organs to the brain than the other way. I, I was coming up with, I like this metaphor of like, I could beat the best dart, like person who's best at darts in the world. Like if I applied 
like the vagus nerve theory to that, I could win if I was the body because I would have nine more throws than that person. You know, they could hit a 20 and all I'd have to hit are twos and threes and I'd kick their ass. And so the point being, no matter how mentally tough we think we are, we could be the most mentally tough person in the world. But if our body is telling us contrary information, if we're, we're going to lose. We're going to be conflicted and uh, disassociative. That's the kind of being disembodied. There's a disassociative term in talk therapy and body therapy, all of it. And that's that disconnection between the mind and body. In fact, even like Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler talked about ways to control people is to find ways to get really create hierarchy, you know, really make them people see that really disconnect their feeling from how they think about themselves. And it's one who's streaming. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> it's, it's, the effectiveness is, is, is real. It, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, it goes so far beyond drumming, you know, it's just so much bigger than drums. This I mean, as much as I love the best drummers in the world, I definitely love somatic, the somatic community more for what they're doing and just what a greater impact they can have so man cool thanks guys this has been great yeah Appreciate man thank it. you adam this uh, is this is awesome oh, oh man thank you much cool yeah i've been i've been subscribing to josh since uh you showed the feldenkrais thing that you posted Jer jeffrey and yeah he's cool he did some triples thing it was like three or four threes and four twos on each has like, brr, 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 brr. I was like what <laughs> like i've never seen burps, anyone burn threes on a hand yeah he wants to be so in tune with his body and what is mind and body uh i think it's a, and just translated into his music that it's like a journey for him to just and he discovers something every pretty much every day he loves like discovering things it's it's crazy what he does and the way and like I've been to a couple of his uh, master classes on Zoom and things like that, uh, and I got a couple of his books. He really does talk about the tensioning, you know, upstrokes, all this stuff, but like relaxation and all that stuff. It's, it's, yeah, he's and he's you know classical drummer or classical percussionist, but you can apply it to a lot of a lot of stuff, man. Yeah, dance. I know polyvagal theory is popular in yoga right now. They're applying a lot of stress resilience. What are trauma therapies? But it's funny, like that T word just loses a lot of people so oh it's not it's polyvagal theory it's like oh what's that oh it's stress resilience oh okay i can do that but it's based in trauma therapy oh you know it's like how stupid is that like the greatest minds in stress resilience are trauma therapists but you can't use the t word so oh well we all have our workarounds i guess you know on words and things like that it's like right now you're talking about another t word just uh traditional that's, <laughs> that, that, that people get stuck on and stuff like that instead of thinking well why do you play traditional because that's the traditional way to play instead of thinking like oh well you know it came from marching and back in the days we, they didn't have actual good setup so they slung the drum and that's literally the only way that you can get good technique or good mechanics out of it yeah you, know, can't go, can't you, go like you don't want to hurt yourself even even in the middle of a battlefield the drummer's like i don't want to hurt my wrist <laughs> you know so they they came up Take with this saturday is <laughs> <laughs> what um what is the function of form so that's what dictated this this form instead of like it being traditional so of course you know that now you play this way because that's how you know how to play instead of like trying to loom match to it so it's a, that's another word that, that people go crazy but they don't actually think about why uh what what's what's behind the word and like what are you trying to like you said trauma and stuff like, that. like what are you well, trying yeah, to yeah it's Absolutely. I, I think that, that that also connects to, to the whole core of, of what Adam, uh, Adam, of what your, your thing is trying to do. And that's breaking up this idea of there is a there is one way that you start to learn the drums and you start here. And the only reason we do it like this is because this is how we've done it for X hundreds of years. And if you don't do it this way, you can't get it right. And I feel like for new drummers, the ability to say, OK, well, what this instrument is is a, an ability for my body to you know kind of find its own rhythm and, and and use that as opposed to well i'm i'm learning these things that i have to memorize and then after a while it'll all come together you know starting from this place of i'm using my body's uh you know synchronicity to you know create music it it, it it, it, there's there's definitely a, a, a
kind of unlearning that we have to do as a drum community when you're talking about what the core of, of being a drummer is and what the, the real heart of, of the most important things that create the best drummers, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's this point that it gets tough to talk about relaxation because it's ultimately you get to a point where you have to consider memory. And when you start considering memory, you have to consider your first age zero to six, how your emotional brain developed and how you developed your st stress resilient profile in that time in your life. And that's when it's like, OK, that gets a little beyond the drum lesson, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I mean, man, it's it's yeah. Um, Gabor Mate, this uh, he's a therapist, philosopher, essentially, and he just all he does is focus on childhood development and like, man, every all of the kind of creatures of healing these days are like, wow, OK, this guy's studies it, it was focused on addiction and he just kept running into this thing. I cure the addiction when I cure or when I help the person understand their stress resilience profile. And I can only do that when we explore what happened to them zero to six, anything that happens, how does that relate to this period of your life? And then he uh, uses psychedelics and hypnosis to like people who will block shit out from when they were four years old. And I mean, he worked with Tim Ferriss and Tim Ferriss found out that he was sexually assaulted in a, in a daycare when he was like four years old. He had this flashback and he was so he man that podcast was as much as i love tim ferris for so long now for him to have had that breakthrough and talk about it and it's really heavy and so but i mean all these methods are ways of for us all to access those parts of ourselves without having to involve another person and you know it can be a real personal journey it, but yeah to talk about relaxation and memory uh, that's a it's a step for a lot of people <laughs> But, uh, cool. Well, thanks for hanging this long, guys. It's always great to talk to you. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, we will hit it again on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah have a great week. Last thing I was going to say, you should have a uh, talking about like words and stuff for that. And uh, for your unisons, if you have it in your chapter, you should call it uh, I don't, because I know you're like, you want to teach unisons before flams. You should just call it, I don't want to say it a lot, but like, F flams, like flams. <laughs> They're a great book or a great title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the title. So this this community I'm going to be starting. My birthday is August 10th. I'm like, OK, fucking A, I'm going to start this before my birthday. If I turn 48 and I haven't done this, I'm going to be bummed. So I'm just like, what do you think? Somatic drummer or somatic drumming or stress resilient drummer? Or I don't know. What do you I don't know? Just ponder it. I'm going to be thinking about yeah, well, we'll, we'll brainstorm with you. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll check in on Monday. So. Cool. We'll think about it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good weekend, you guys. I'll yeah. see you soon.